PCOS Part 2. Excess insulin disrupts the ovulation process and can prevent female fertility. From the Metabolic Classroom, InsulinIQ.com. So, Steve, how does insulin mess it up? So the process you just described was the normal physiological process of ovulation. How do things get pathophysiological or how do things go wrong when insulin suddenly wants to join the party? That's a great question. And particularly in the situation of PCOS, which is that polycystic ovary syndrome. And it's a syndrome that has three uh, main things, main categories that, that it has to have. It has to have oligomenorrhea, which is um, which means uh, more distant or longer menstruation, meaning people don't have normal regular periods. So that's one thing it could have in it. Uh, another thing is uh, hyperandrogenism. So that means high testosterone or testosterone like substances where people have clinically elevated testosterone. And then, um, and then it has all these cysts on the ovary, other kind of more, uh, associations with that uh, are also, um, this insulin resistance and metabolic disease that is part of it. So in PCOS, the metabolic portion of it is not the actual, a diagnostic criteria that we use, but we inevitably see it. How does PCOS work is, is still up for debate. I think there's quite a bit of debate. There's definitely a genetic component that drives that. Uh, but there's also a physiologic component, uh, particularly that has to do with obesity that can drive uh, that. Some people say that it has to have a two hit hypothesis where you have a genetic predisposition to have this insulin resistance, to have uh, anovulatory or oligoovulatory, meaning low ovulation. Uh, and then on top of that, one, if people hit a certain point uh, metabolically with obesity or other insulin resistance, then they kind of cross that tipping point. Um, but not all people are the same with PCOS. Some mm -hmm. people uh, are, are quite thin uh, and have PCOS. Some people are, have more fat in their body. And, and so they don't always follow the same mold, but there is a typical one. You've mentioned how uh, testosterone and androgens, the prototypical male sex hormones, but of course that's an oversimplification. All men have both androgens and estrogens. All women have both androgens and estrogens. Um, so each sex needs them. It's just in different levels. Women have, of course, much lower androgen and much higher estrogen relative to men. All these prototypical sex hormone, female sex hormones, they all came from testosterone. It's just a matter of how much of it's getting converted. And that's, that's acted through this enzyme called aromatase. And ovaries are just doing this at a much, much higher level than the testes are. And so women are just converting more of this testosterone into the estrogens. Too much insulin actually starts to directly impact that, that enzyme, right? That's right. Well, yes. And, and particularly uh, with cholesterol synthesis and then distribution, it is a bit of a fluid relationship between estrogen, testosterone, estrone, estriol. Those are all different forms of estrogen. Some are more potent. Same thing with mm -hmm. testosterone and, and, and so, and dihydrotestosterone. And yep. so there's uh, similarly, some are more potent than others, but that estradiol is the most potent form, and that is created directly from testosterone through aromatase. Yeah, and so then when insulin comes in, estrogen, then we have lower levels of estrogen production because of the high insulin. <clears throat> and now we have the, the, the woman who doesn't have enough estrogens to facilitate ovulation. So when insulin comes in, prevents this rise in estrogens. And now we have all these follicles in the ovaries that were developing, waiting to kind of get into the game for one to become the dominant ovulatory follicle. But in the absence of this estrogen spike, we fail to have that one follicle become the dominant and then ovulatory follicle. How does insulin make the normal physiological process of ovulation become a pathophysiological process? Dr. Steve Cole. PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, has three main categories of disorder. 
One, oligomenorrhea, longer infrequent menstruation. Two, hyperandrogenism, high testosterone. And three, many cysts on the ovaries. Also, in association with PCOS, insulin resistance is a major factor. In PCOS, the metabolic portion of the syndrome is not part of the typical diagnosis, but we inevitably see it. How does PCOS work? There is a genetic component and there is a physiologic component, especially obesity. Some say you must have both genetic predisposition and insulin resistance to have this anovulatory outcome. However, some people who have it are quite thin. All men have both androgen and estrogen, and all women have both. Each sex needs them both, but in different amounts. Women have much lower androgen and much higher estrogen compared to men. Of the prototypical female sex hormones, all came from testosterone. It just depends on how much is converted. This is enacted through the enzyme aromatase. Ovaries converting at much higher level than testes, so women convert more testosterone into estrogen than men. Too much insulin has a negative impact on aromatase enzyme. Yes, particularly with cholesterol synthesis and distribution, it is a fluid relationship between estrogen, testosterone, estrone, different forms of estrogen, some more potent, and the same for testosterone. Some forms are more potent. Estradiol is the most potent converted through aromatase. When insulin comes in at too high an amount, you have lower levels of estrogen production. Then the woman's estrogen is not high enough to facilitate ovulation. Insulin prevents the rise in estrogens. Now all the ovary follicles who had been waiting and developing to become the dominant ovulatory follicle, but in the absence of an estrogen spike, we fail. Annotated, summarized, easy to share with loved ones.